Okay, good, good. Well, thank you for inviting me. I, I do like uh, presenting this material and uh, I've given this presentation a number of times and each time I give it, I try to update my data, uh, add something interesting. So people who have seen this before, there's always gonna be something new in it. And, um, and, and just the latest research that I've done or the latest back testing. And uh, today I'll, uh, I'm including the latest back testing that I've just recently completed for 2016 through 2021. Um, I will say this presentation is for informational purposes only. This presentation and all information contained herein is not investment advice and not intended to be investment advice. Any trades you make based on this information or your responsibility alone. And I disclaim any liability loss risk resulting directly or indirectly from the use or application of, it, of any of the contents of this presentation. So I wanted to answer with this back test was how does trading different deltas affect the trade and how do different spread widths perform? And how does using different stops, such as a one-time stop, two-time stop, or three-time stop, affect the results? These are questions I get. You know, people often ask me, well, what if I sell Delta 25 instead of Delta 5? Doesn't that mean I make more money? Well, it could be, but you also get stopped out more. And if I trade, how about I trade a five wide spread instead of a 25 wide spread or a 50 wide spread? Don't I make more money? Well, not necessarily. And uh, same thing with stops. People always ask me about what if I use a 0.5 stop or a five times stop? You know, if I give it more room, will it not go against me? Uh, and, and not necessarily. So, and how does using different percentages of buying power affect the results? So I tried to address these questions that I get asked a lot in this back test. And one caveat to back testing, uh, back testing always looks at what might have happened in the past based on a certain set of rules. It does not mean you can or should expect this performance in the future because what happened in the past does not predict what happens in the future. However, the, there's a likelihood that these trades will behave similarly in the future. And that's why I do back testing. I kind of want to see what was the worst performing year? What was the best performing year? Assuming that my performance is going to be somewhere in between. Or, or um, I've also done some Monte Carlo simulations to kind of see what are the probabilities of a you know, the worst outcome you could imagine. And, and it's very low for this trade or the best outcome you can imagine, that's also very low. So it's usually somewhere in between. And actual results in actual trading will always vary from backtesting results because market conditions are always changing. And there's a psychological component to trading that backtesting doesn't take into account. Like if you've, if you've had seven trades in a row stop out, it gets very difficult to place that eighth trade. You start wanting to change the rules. You start wanting to do something different. And in back testing, you can keep the rules exactly the same. In live testing, in live trading, you know, there is a psychological component. You know, unless you're a robot and you can automate these trades, but unless you're a robot, that psychological component is a big component and can affect your results. So I believe that trading with a set of rules helps remove some of the emotions from trading, but they can still be a factor. We're all human. Um, and also backtesting ignores any news at the time, ignores market conditions, ignores many factors that may influence you as a trader in live trading. So with that, I present these backtesting results. So we used, um, I have a group of people that I work with and we purchased uh, a one minute options data on SPX from CBOE. We have a subscription, so we get current data. Uh, this back test, just because the data that we had when I was doing this only goes through September uh, 2021. So the, it's five and a half years of data in this back test. Uh, commissions, 
you know, you do pay higher commissions with SPX. I used a dollar sixty-five, which would kind of be about the worst case commissions that I've seen uh, brokerages charge. There is a CBOE fee that is charged for any SPX trade on top of whatever options commissions your um, your uh, broker may charge, and um, and then I included a five cent slippage. So uh, for all trades getting in and getting out, actual slippage can vary greatly, especially on the getting out side. Um, you know, in a fast moving market, you could have uh, 10 or 20 cent slippage. I used a starting capital of $30,000. So that's about the minimum I would use to trade this strategy because you want to avoid the, the uh, day trading um, pattern day trading rules that brokers have. And uh, it's best to use uh, use starting capital of, of more than 25,000. So I use 30 in this example. I traded both puts and calls uh, when, the, when, the, when it seemed appropriate. And then I re-entered if I was stopped out. Um, and I studied the various delta, uh, variables of delta, spread width, stop, and buying power. So in this first study, I look at trading different deltas. And uh, I, I list here the compound car is compounded annual return for those who may not know. So compounded annual return of trading delta five is 23%. Your max drawdown is, is minus 23%. So the best year was 2020, that high volatility year with a 74% return. The worst year was a minus 6% return in 2018. Um, Delta 10, a compounded annual growth rate of 56%. Max drawdown also increases to 43%. The best year for Delta 10 was a 292% return in 2020. And the worst year was a minus 28% return. So you'll see some things work for you and against you in this. The higher Delta you go, the higher compounded annual growth rate, which takes into account these larger drawdowns. So personally, I don't like to go, I don't like to, trade a strategy that's going to have greater than a 30% drawdown on my account. And, and so I usually trade somewhere between five and 10 uh, delta. And in 2020, I was trading down at delta three because you could still get good credit. I hadn't done this study. I wasn't sure what was going to happen, but I did okay trading delta three and made money that year. And, um, and, and, but this shows if I traded it strictly using a Delta 10, I would have made a 292% return. That's a fantastic return. So, um, so even though you can get higher returns, I just don't personally don't like those bigger drawdowns. And I would feel horrible if I had a 55% loss on my account in any one year or an 82% loss. So I avoid these. I, I tend to look at what's my risk and what's the drawdown and put greater, greater emphasis on that and look, still look for a good compounding. Like I'd be happy with 23% average uh, compounded annual return every year. That'd be great. And um, and so I'm aiming for somewhere between these two. And that's generally where I've hit uh, on the years I've traded these. Now, the next slide, I included all the data. You can go over this in detail. It, it tells you the win rates and the number of wins and number of consecutive losing days. It breaks down the performance by year. You can look at that in more detail on your own. Uh, we don't have enough time tonight to go into that. And then for this study, I took the average of the best two performers. And I'd say that's about what I've been trading is, you know, Delta 7.5. Usually six to seven Delta is where I find my, a lot of my trades. 
and um, so then we look at different spread widths and look at the same kind of performance. So I, I use the delta target of 7.5, still a two times loss and using 50% of the buying power for this and just see how different spread widths perform. So you can see the tighter spreads have a lower uh, compounded annual return, uh, except for that 50 wide had a lower compounded annual return. The 15 wide, a little higher, 20 wide, about the same, 25 wide, a little better, slightly better. Um, the drawdown was higher on these lower uh, spreads though, 58% max drawdown, 50% max drawdown. So again, I kind of, I designed my strategy so I don't have a drawdown of greater than 30%. And, um, and drawdown, if you're not familiar with that, is defined as from a prior high to the next time you make a prior high, how far did it drop down? How much of your account value did you lose from that high point? So, you know, I still might have been uh, profitable in from when I started trading in that kind of drawdown, but that's from the high of the account. So based on these results, I choose to trade a 25 wide spread. Um, you know, the worst performing year with the 50 wide spread was a minus 1% return, which is pretty darn good for a, a bad year. Uh, 25 wide is 10%, still I'm fine with that. But, um, you know, if you want, if you're okay with a little lower return, you can trade a, a 50 wide spread and reduce that drawdown. And, uh, but you also reduce the, the best performing year by about half. Uh, so there's always, uh, for every gimme you got, there's a gotcha, as uh, somebody from Tastyworks says. So again, there's the backup data for that. And then looking at different stops. Again, this shows that uh, for the lower stops, you generally have a lower return, uh, except for those stops. Like if you took it to touch, the annual return would be about the same as if you traded with a five wide or a 0.5 stop of 19% and 17%. And um, so again, I can let you look at all these numbers, but I choose to trade uh, three times stop results in two times net loss. And um, the, the max drawdown, 31%. The worst year was minus 10, 10%. The best year was 141% return on that stop. And then finally, looking at the uh, different buying powers uh, use. And of course, the more buying power you use, the greater your returns are gonna be, but also your drawdowns are gonna be higher. So uh, I, I usually don't recommend trading more than you know, 40 to 50% of your buying power. I probably tend to be more in the 40% of my buying power. And, um, but you can have some great returns if you're willing to risk more for uh, risk and reward are very much uh, on either side of the, the balance there. So that explains why I trade what I trade. And then there's all the detail you can go over. So your time on a trade that the probabilities are showing it's not profitable. And then a couple of bits of information. If you have any questions about this trade or you wanna trade it, uh, I'd recommend joining the Tasty Trade Options group on Facebook uh, and enter it exactly as it's spelled there where the two capital T's and Tasty Trade Options. Uh, I'm one of two administrators. Uh, it's not limited to discussions about Tasty Trade methods. There's a lot of us who trade a lot of different strategies. Most of us found each other by trading Tasty Trade uh, trades or using their strategies, but a lot of us have moved on from there and found other good trades and we share it with each other. Uh, we do try to keep that group civil. We 
we boot anybody that tries to spam. So you won't see a lot of spam in there. Uh, we ask when you join or when you request to join, we ask you a few questions and that's how we can, we can tell by how you're answering the questions. You know, you can say I'm inexperienced. I don't know what my favorite strategy is. I'm just here to learn. That's fine. People that there's, there's spammers. We know how they answer those questions and, and they tend to give the same answers it's like they take a seminar on how to how to get in these groups and they all enter the same way. So we keep those people out. And uh, there are quite a few people in that group that trade this system. And we post frequently about what work, what's working, what's not working, or any changes in my strategy. Like I used to trade 50 wide until I started doing some of this back testing to show me that 25 wide works even better. And if you wanna email me, uh, there's my email address and I love emails. It may take me a few days to get to your question, but uh, feel free to email me and um, I, can, I can help you out or direct you or answer any questions you have. And uh, those questions are often things that I will use as, as ideas for another presentation. And uh, so it, it gives me an idea of what people are understanding and what they're not understanding. And, uh, and, and I try to uh, uh, give back what I've learned from others. So uh, it's all good. And then a recommendation on back testing software. I'll say uh, with back testing is one of the things that I did that really put my options trading on steroids is learning to back test really helped my trading because I didn't have to trade something to know if it was a good strategy or not. I, I could just look at how the, how the trades behaved and how they worked and how to enter, what worked, what didn't work. And so uh, I'd, if you're interested in back testing, I'd recommend this option net explorer. There's not very many uh, not very many software packages out there that have uh, one DTE or zero DTE options data, and most are most soft most back testing software uses end of day data, which is no good for this trade because you need to know what happened during the day. And uh, Option Net Explorer has intraday data. It has all the Greeks. It has good risk graphs. And it's also got good trade analysis tools if you do a number of trades. So I, I did not do this backtesting with this, but I do a lot of backtesting uh, with Option Net Explorer. And uh, so I recommend it. And that's it for tonight. I think